This episode of the Move Mind podcast is brought to you by CBD Mountain, the sport and fitness CBD. Head over to cbdmountain.com for a range of soft gels, skin balms, oils and vapes, and purchase online and have the premium quality CBD delivered directly to your door. cbdmountain.com I'm joined today by Mr. Zahir Akram from Akram Yoga, a yoga studio based in Surrey. And Zahir is also author of the book Yoga, Madness or Meditation. And I'm super happy to have Zahir on the show today. He was my yoga teacher back in the UK when I was there. Um, Zahir, thanks for coming on the show. Mate, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited as well, mate. I can't wait. So Zahir, I want to just start, basically start the show off with asking you, physical journey, journey into the body and mind. Where does it all begin with Zaheer, the, the yogic path, the physical path? Where does it all start? Well, my kind of physical journey goes further back than um, my initial interest in yoga. I've always been into uh, exercise, movement, always, always loved sport, loved trying every type of sport. So I, was all, I always understood that the, the more you look after your body, the more the mind will look after itself. I, I, I found sport and exercise as a way of keeping myself sane. I didn't do it directly. I didn't, I, I didn't go you know, um, and immerse myself into exercise thinking it's going to help my mind. I knew it, that, would, that is what would happen as a consequence. Yeah. So, and, you know, it's really interesting because people who do yoga only, Harry, they don't do anything else. They assume that yoga is unique in that it helps you clear your mind and nothing else can do that for you <laughs> yeah. i always say to them especially those who do yoga and nothing else that people who go rock climbing people who go to the gym who do jujitsu whatever they do that's their form of meditation or yoga they do it because it yeah. brings them a certain clarity a certain peace of mind it makes them healthier healthier brain as well and it's not exclusive to yoga that's partly what the book is about as well the madness on meditation you know you people who do yoga and yoga only just get caught up in this unique little world and i guess with your experience you would know in martial arts as well some people who do nothing but their yeah. discipline you can end up just you can cage yourself into this little um ignorant world i think and there's such a a vast um, universe out there to explore and understand you can't just get caught up in in that one type of mindset yeah agreed yeah it's, a, it's fascinating isn't it that the system that you're into can become your own dogma and before you know it you've got the blinkers on and you've forgotten that there might be hundreds of other ways to achieve what you're talking about you know through other other ways so did you have like any other sports then growing up that you kind of got into first were there I know there was a martial arts influence I think somewhere along the way wasn't there yeah I mean my my, my biggest love beyond anything else is of course cricket uh, yes. being, from that, being from that part of the world it's it's in my blood and bones i i just i could spend all day watching it and uh i think that's what won over laura's dad one of the first questions i asked him was whether imran khan was better than ian botham and he's a massive cricket fan he's a member of the mcc so we just kicked off straight away so I just love playing cricket. I love playing football. Um, I got into martial arts because, well, Thai boxing more specifically because uh, one of my friends, Richard, went over to Australia and when he came back, he was a world champion and he opened his own gym. So part of it was for the love of the, of the sport and staying fit, but also to just support my friend. Um, and I would go to the gym at the same time. So I would just try and do loads um, as much as I could um like i said i've always just enjoyed movement i've always enjoyed yeah. um looking after myself and feeling good about myself which is i think the key thing that people need to understand about exercise you you do it because it makes you feel better about who you are yeah yeah there's definitely i mean the science is showing now there's a carryover to that isn't there even cerebrally like in the endorphin release and the, the patterns in the brain that happen before during after um, so you, you're into the Thai boxing and then along that journey, do you think, you know what, we'll complement this nicely, a bit of yoga. How, do you, how does the transfer into yoga come about? It was really, it was really random, actually, because um, I have a bad back, which I've had since I was 17, 18 years old. I was in a car accident and 
in my younger days when I was more active as you are you know you're at your your social peak you're always going out you're moving you can eat what you want yeah. um, I, it didn't really catch up on me but later when I started working in an office in my kind of early mid-20s and I, I wasn't moving as much and I have really noticed then that my back was not great and over a period of time it felt like it was deteriorating more and more so I stopped um, it Thai boxing or stop taking it seriously and wanting to do more because I just I was just in too much pain I I stopped playing football and cricket a long time ago at this point I just couldn't run there was yeah. too much pressure on my back and um, then one of uh, the members of staff at LA Fitness that I worked at um, she came out with this genius idea she goes let's go to yoga <laughs> and I was like woman please <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she goes, no, we're going to do hot yoga. It's over in um, in Fleet. Um, give it a go. And so I was like, okay, maybe. So I gave the regular yoga a, a chance before I went, and I just kept hurting myself because right. the temperature and you know, it was, I, I mean, the class I was doing, I, I asked once if I could leave my trainers on. That's that's the temperature of the room. It was just wasn't. Yeah. You you can't stretch in that environment, no matter who you are. So I thought, okay, let's give this hot yoga a go. Went along, it was the Bikram sequence. I loved it. I loved how I felt after. Yeah. Um, I, I realized that the, 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 you know, the more loose my hips are, the more, the more movement around my knees, the less my back needs to work. Mm. Um, you know, in, in, at times when it shouldn't, like lifting something off the ground. And yeah, I just, I just completely fell in love with it, mate. Amazing. Yeah. It only takes that one time, doesn't it? When you feel the difference in your joints or where your restrictions yeah. were. Once you feel it's that. Like, it's like meeting Laura. <laughs> you know, you, you just know the first time you just fall in love head over heels and you just think, right, this is, this is what's, this is what I'm meant to do. And this is what I kind of want to do. Um, you, you can do other sports and you can enjoy it and, but we all have that one love like you would have with your, you know, with jujitsu. And when I was younger, you know, it was playing cricket. But in terms of movement now, in terms of what I know is the, what's best for my body, um, it is yoga. But it's modified yoga, not yoga in general. Okay, yeah, this is interesting to, it's important to put a distinction between the two, right? Because yoga is an umbrella term now. Well, I mean, Absolutely. <laughs> it's Massively. an umbrella term. I mean, the biggest... I think the biggest misconception, or there's so many, that, that the book literally is all about the nonsense of the yoga world. But one of the biggest, um, I wouldn't say it's a lie, or I say it's a very naive statement, is that uh, yoga is good for people with back pain, or if you've got back pain, do yoga. And right. I say, no, no, no. If you have back pain, don't do yoga you need to learn how to modify certain yoga poses to accommodate your pain, uh, pain trigger and injury. Um, you don't take your body and try to fit it into a yoga pose. So Interesting. if you said to me, Harry, I've got a bad back. Um, should I do yoga? Should I do a yoga class? I'd say no. I'd wow. say you need to find someone skilled enough to teach you how you can do a handful of yoga poses um designed for hips knees etc to make you more mobile doesn't in a weird way doesn't even directly work your spine you know you don't need to back bend and forward fold um find a skilled yoga teacher and in all honesty you know people don't like me saying this there are very few however in my experience so it's a real battle to find that person who's going to help you so you don't actually go to yoga and end up feeling worse yeah agreed yeah the, the struggle is real for the good teachers and when it comes to the modification side of things is that something that can be done with you know props blocks straps or is it just a case of modifying the leverage of a position or is it a bit of both it's a bit of both to be honest with you but more importantly it's trying to work out with uh, firstly with a skilled like clinician or physiotherapist uh, working out what is the um, movement which kind of um, sets off pain or discomfort for example Harry you might be someone who finds discomfort in flexion or rounding as you go to pick something up so if you um, are kind of flexion intolerant or find that movement very difficult you need to 
not necessarily avoid yoga poses that do that, but learn the difference between loaded flexion and unloaded flexion. For example, you can walk your hands down a wall in forward fold with your back rounded and because your hands are resting on the wall, there's no pressure on your back. Right. That is safe. But if you do it without the wall in your normal kind of what a ragdoll position, yeah. your spine is completely under load and it's not the best thing for your back if you are flexion intolerant. Right. Yeah. Same with back bending. At the minute, I'm going through a stage, Harry, where back bending is just horrible. So for now, I, I appear to be extension intolerant. Yeah. Uh, can I, but wheel feels nice because my hands are on the ground and my spine is not under a load. But right. if I stood upright and did the Bikram back bend yeah. with no support, it would kill me. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, so the, 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 the art to yoga with pain, especially back pain, is firstly with your therapist or whoever you're working with, try and work out what movements cause you pain and then take that to yoga and either take it out for a while until you build your tolerance back up for that movement yep. or learn how to do that movement in a modified way. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, smart. it's a smart approach. I like your specifics there. Yeah, saying yoga is good or bad for back pain. It's too general, isn't it? You've got to zoom in a little bit and modify, modify and be, be smart about it. Massively. I mean, the very thing that you love to do is the reason you're in pain. So <laughs> if you said to me, I've got a bad shoulder, I'd be like, well, of course you do. You do so much of whatever it is you do. Yep. Chances are that the wear and tear builds up. It's just the way we are. So yeah. we then have to look outside the box of our discipline to think, can we make ourselves more durable somehow and then return back to the discipline we love? The, yeah. Or learn to modify uh, your approach in your discipline so you, you're not hurting yourself as often. So, for example, in yoga, you can also take a step away from yoga make your body more durable and then return to yoga if it's what you love knowing that you're less likely to hurt yourself because you're just you're more resistant now you're durable you're stronger yeah agreed yeah, I, I found in my own experience when i came and first met you yoga was the missing link to my sort of jujitsu strength and conditioning and then yoga sort of became the missing link in the triangle as jujitsu was battering me lifting was battering me and then I needed a restorative kind of component to kind of complete that, yeah, sure. that triangle. So yoga, yoga was the, the, the missing link for me. Whereas other people I know that, that, you know, and some of the teachers that work with you, they just yoga, yoga, yoga. And then they benefit from going and doing something like lifting to complement the yoga side of things and make themselves more durable for the yoga that way. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is the way, the way things are. I mean, we ask when we do something we love, whether it's yoga, whether it's cricket, or whether it's jujitsu, we are surrounded by people who only do that discipline and nothing else. Yes. And their view on health and fitness is blurred by their like, unconditional passion and love for that yeah. discipline. So yeah. asking a jujitsu teacher or a yoga teacher or a football coach, what is the best thing for my back is not the, the it's not a, like an intelligent question you're asking the wrong person so yeah. you can't ask a yoga teacher uh, really um what should i do for my shoulder because chances are most of the time not every time that teacher's love um for yoga means that they're probably going to try and recommend something within the yoga <laughs> with the yoga goggles yeah yeah and it's the same as you know when i to um when i to train in other areas so say for example i lift weights if I was to ask a weightlifting coach, he'd be like, oh, you're doing something wrong or we need to do this or we need to do that. But rarely do they take their goggles off and say, OK, well, let's look outside the box. Are you too rigid? Are you not flexible enough or are you weak somewhere? Do you need to do additional things? But yeah. we, you know, we rarely surround ourselves with people who have the, these open minds to tell you that athletically speaking, you need to have a balance of everything, balance, coordination, strength, flexibility, mobility. There are so many kind of elements that make up the athlete or when I say athlete, I don't mean an athlete who competes. If you run after the ice cream brand, if you run after your kids, run up the stairs, you're an athlete, you're moving athletically. Um, in order to move 
in a way that doesn't cause you pain and that gives you a good quality of life, you need to understand there are various um, facets to the athletic diamond, as my friend Mika calls it. You yeah. know, like there's so many things you need to consider. Yeah. It, 90% of it exists outside of the bubble that you and I exist in. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Now with the hot yoga side of things, obviously the, the studio is heated to a temperature. One of the first things I noticed when I came for was probably after about, probably after about six weeks, I really noticed in my jujitsu, the transfer of sort of local muscular endurance, that my muscles just had a bit more endurance that when I was sparring, especially I'd be getting hot and sweaty. And I was like, this is familiar. This is, this is yeah. like jujitsu and this is like hot yoga. I, I'm used to this. What are some of the benefits that you sort of found and noticed um, with more quote unquote athletic populations when they went, when they've been doing hot yoga? I think it's uh, the answer is, isn't really what you're after, but I think it's quite unique to each, each athlete or each person. Right. I mean, there are some people who take nothing athletically from it or physically. They right. just, it's a, a kind of a headspace that they get Interesting. or an escapism from whatever it is that's causing them so much stress and pressure. Because if you do love a discipline wholeheartedly, you might be earning some money from it, which adds a lot of pressure to what you're doing. So right. if, if, you know, I had a friend who was uh, competing in a, a boxing contest, this is about a month or so ago, and he was coming to yoga every night, a week leading up to his contest, because it was the biggest purse that he was gonna get for his fight. And he was stressed by the expectation it was his first fight outside of the uh, York Hall um, in London. Oh. York Hall is, although it's the kind of mecca of boxing in the UK, it's fairly small. Oh. And stepping outside of that to an O2 where you're getting, you know, 5,000 odd people, etc., cetera, it was a big step up. So he was coming every evening for different reasons. So if you asked him the question, Harry, about what you get from yoga, it wouldn't be anything physical. Yeah. It's just about headspace, breathing, and actually something he learned from me, which he hadn't um, thought about before, he's learning to belly breathe. So in between um, rounds, before he's even listening to his coach, he's thinking, am I getting enough oxygen in? Am I belly breathing? Yeah. And he's finding now he's better able to process what his coach is telling him in between rounds because he's calmer, he's belly breathing. So, yeah, interesting. you know, it, it's very different for everyone. You know, runners might come in and they might, ease off tension in their hips and hamstrings by 5%, Harry, 5%. And it might change the quality of their running. You know, they might loosen their hips 5% and they get longer strides, they feel better. Yeah. But they don't notice, Harry, they still feel tight because they're comparing themselves to someone else in the class who perhaps is, you know, almost like a contortionist. Yeah. So the little bit of flexibility people gain, up to 5% is enough to change their discipline it makes them more and i guess the reason it increases their endurance in their in the sport or the discipline is their muscles are now no longer operating in such a resistant or tight state yeah. so if you're running with a muscle that is partially contracted already or tight because it's desperately trying to support your joints because it hasn't been released it's going to stress more it's going to tire more that's that's yeah. your body telling your brain you've had enough yeah, but if you're yeah. able to release the muscle, get it to relax, it, it, you develop the uh, muscle's ability to contract more without overly complicating it with science. You know, it's, yeah. it, it, you, you know, your endurance does improve because you're working with muscles that remember what their full length or range of motion is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've definitely felt that for myself. And then you mentioned there about the, the, the mental side of things. And a lot of people say that the hot yoga is a, is a mental challenge especially when they first start i i could attest to that i definitely noticed the panic well up inside me i got to get out i got to get out and then try and calm myself down what are some sort of bits of advice you give to newcomers that come in and they might experience that mental challenge of coming into a hot yoga studio for the first or second time and they feel that desire to maybe to maybe leave or it getting really hot um sure actually harry we because our studio is is heated with water and it's not like the bikram brand i mean ours is about 34 rather than 40 degrees of bikram yeah. we rarely get that um that kind of psychological battle yeah very, very few people feel like they want to leave 
the psychological battle we get is with people who just feel so stupid people right. who feel so intimidated um yeah. and there's a reason harry why men don't stick to doing yoga because you know what we're like with our egos we feel so stupid and so if you said to me to hear what's the prerequisite to come into yoga i would say harry if you have a sense of humor and you're willing to laugh at yourself you will love yoga and you will do great but if you take yourself very seriously if you come to yoga today expecting to be the best and you're not going to be but if that's your expectation you're going to hate it you'll be so disheartened you won't you won't actually come back right yeah. you'd rather stay at home uh, and and not put yourself in that situation because the fear of looking silly is one of the biggest fears that we all battle with on a daily basis it's just a it's human nature it's the way we are yeah so that's the biggest battle is trying to explain to people and trying to get them to understand that drop not the ego that's not the right word drop the kind of the seriousness about it all right don't take it so seriously have a sense of humor laugh at yourself when you can't do something and you know if you came to a monday night class at 8 p.m that i teach if you saw some of the men who come into my class it, it's one of the most fun classes you could have and guys are falling over left right and center trying their arm balances and handstands but they're always laughing and those who come in and those who've been coming for years just have a great sense of humor and that is what you need i think yeah fantastic um i 100 agree yeah you've got to stop taking yourself so seriously have a laugh and it's uh you can get stuck in much much better i think that we way. also get that impression from yoga us men we we look at these you know fancy women in class and online and we look at that and think wow it looks a bit serious i'm not sure if i yeah and but so we go in thinking are we supposed to be that serious <laughs> kind of go in. and you know we go in very stressed the teacher is sitting there like this chanting away halo over her head we think we should have the same posture and you know we should think we should adopt the same hand mudras it's all very serious and that's the impression we get based on everything that we see yeah. especially social media you know, yes. if you go on to uh, hashtag yoga, you see gong baths, you see chanting, you see people with the most ridiculously serious faces and posture. Um, you know, you see Westerners dressed up as Indians. It all looks so <laughs> serious. You think, forget that. I'm going to the pub where at least everyone acts like themselves, right? Yeah, interesting. So do you think all of that kind of stuff then is ultimately unnecessary to get something out of a yoga practice? That's just all add-on, is it? Oh, mate, it's all superficial, isn't it? I mean, what? <laughs> the thing is, Harry, is, is, is when we take on a discipline that is from a completely separate culture, and perhaps you'll understand this with jiu-jitsu, there's a certain amount of respect you need to have from the culture where it's come from. Agreed. Right? Yeah. Um, in the yoga world, it's actually sometimes Thai boxing was very similar as well. You'd see people who... Um, would act as if they are from Thailand. Yeah. They'd be, they would be given a nickname from a Thai nickname from their teacher. Yeah. They would be covered in Thai tattoos. They would spend six months a year in Thailand. They would only eat Thai food, you know. It, and they get so lost and caught up in what they're doing. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, I guess. But there's also a lot to be said for how you can then teach someone an art of being the best you can be and being the best of yourself when you're actually doing everything you can to try and act like someone you're not. And yeah. from a yogic perspective, what is yoga? If, if you, it's a difficult question, but you can argue that it's the science of self-realization. And how are you going to teach someone the science of self-realization if on a daily basis you are just acting like the yoga teacher you think you should be? Yes, interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, you're trying to fit a mold hence, already. Hence the madness, Harry, hence the, the madness. Mad, the madness. It was one of the first things I noticed about you, actually, when I, when I came to your classes, and it was that this is here unabashedly himself. It wasn't try, you weren't trying to be anyone. It was just, this is me. And it wasn't, there was no gimmicks. It was just honest and open i was like oh this is refreshing i don't have to feel Which like i need to Harry, be if I, if I came to you to learn something that's all i want right you know, the, we we want to learn and we want to be inspired by people who we can relate to 
And I think over a period of time, people start to notice the, pho the phonies and the fake yoga teachers and the fake jujitsu instructors and stuff. We, yeah. we see past it once we understand the discipline a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I just don't think you can keep up appearances like that for, for very long. Your students notice, but also you can't be happy within yourself if you're, it, it becomes like performing on stage, doesn't it? Every day you're behind the screen, you're putting on your outfit, you're remembering your lines, you're stressing yourself about the character you need to play and you go out and you might put on a wonderful performance. People clap and say, that was a great class. Thank you. You come behind the curtain, you close, you take a big deep breath. You think, wow, I got away with another phony. Performance today. <laughs> yeah. I got away with it, yeah. You can keep doing that. Agreed. Yeah. Before you either burn out or someone sniffs you out. Yeah. 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 Sure. A combination of the two. And, but if you, you know, um, don't like to, mention this but when after you left harry i won that award which wasn't a big deal yeah it was it wasn't i mean it was it was nothing really but it was a lot to be said for that because winning an award for the best yoga teacher and i was like that's really ironic because the last thing i am is a yoga teacher <laughs> yeah you're not trying to be that and when my students say here like what what what's the secret i said well I'm Zaheer, who still makes fun of people, still sarcastic in class. I have a laugh, the odd sexist joke here and there, as long as, <laughs> as, long as people know that it, I'm just having fun and you know, I, I, I try not to uh, make my wise crack when there's new people because they might not get me. Um, but I am literally just myself. The person I am at reception, the person I am at home, the person I am when I pop out, I, I, I walk straight into the studio and don't take a single thought about what I'm going to do, Harry. It's just who I am. Yeah, um, nice. Teaching is a complete expression of your personality. And there's a lot to be said, again, if people have voted for that, if they've said he's the best yoga teacher, maybe people are just getting sick of walking in and the, the teacher walks in and the lights change and there's, you know, uh, wind chimes and there's, you know, incense candles and the teacher walks in with an aura. She's like, she floats in wearing a sari and her name is Julie, probably. You know, it's, it's all a bit too much. And some people just want to go and escape and do yoga and stretch. They don't, they're not there because they want to channel their inner goddess. They're just there to stretch. Yeah. Yeah. They just want the simplest, most effective thing for the next 60 minutes. Yeah. It doesn't involve all the extras and the, <laughs> the gimmicks, yeah, as it, it were. All the extras should be a, a kind of an organic or natural consequence of the physical side. Yeah. You know, you, you immerse yourself into the physical side and you, it's like a lifelong dedication and all the other things just happen. They're never forced. They just kind of happen. And if they don't happen, they don't happen. Yeah. Agreed. Now you mentioned just now about <laughs> the Monday 8 PM class with the guys falling over and trying the hand balancing and, stuff like that. Now, when it comes to hand balancing, uh, I guess my first question is, where does the, the art of inverting and hand balancing come into the yoga practice? Uh, maybe for yourself personally, like how did you start the, the hand balancing journey? Um, well, in, in terms of going back to the, to like, to the history of it, it, I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but it was, it's actually quite a, um, it's quite a new thing. Um, we're talking from like the forties or fifties onwards, right. the, um, these arm balances and handstands were introduced to yoga as yoga was looking almost for a bit of um, globalization. Right, right, right. It was, it was looking outside the box a little bit and it, it, it was influenced by um, Indian wrestling, gymnastics, all these other things. Yeah. And yoga evolved from, what was generally a, a seated meditative practice to something which is a little bit more physically demanding. Yeah. Um, there's a, a documentary called Breath of the Gods where uh, the children of the grandfather of uh, physical yoga poses says that the children or the youngsters who were coming to the yoga shala needed to become stronger and more durable in case they were going to go to war I assume he means with Pakistan at the time. Right. So these kids were coming to the yoga shala to learn from the great Krishnamacharya and they weren't 
going there to sit down and be meditative. They needed to be moved, to be agile, to be stronger, etc. Yeah. So Krishnamacharya very intelligently kind of fused what was in vogue at the time with uh, uh, you know gymnastics. There was a, a, a gymnasium a few doors down from the Shala in Mysore. So it was all influence. And so it's a fairly new thing. Right. Because of that, Harry, a lot of people in the yoga world, a lot of airy fairy yoga people, they tend to say that it's not a handstands and arm balances are not real yoga. Right, right, right. So you, you, well, in my experience, I've found that there's a bit of a disparity. There's a bit of a, a kind of ongoing debate of whether they belong in yoga or not. You find the very um, kind of restorative and relaxing type yoga teachers who will say they're not. They've got nothing to do with yoga. Yoga is not about being on your head. <laughs> um, you get other people like me and say, no, yoga is 100% about being on your head. Because if you think that yoga is psychological, if you think yoga is purely trying to get you to work yourself out who you are and, and what you're capable of, what you're worthy of, again, the science of self-realization, how can you work out who you are, what you're capable of, how much courage you have, how much strength you have, your real nature if you've convinced yourself that oh i can't possibly do an arm balance or i can't possibly do a headstand or a handstand so although they are relatively new additions to physical yoga in my opinion they're actually some of the most important additions to yoga because once you overcome your fears harry you are amazed at what you're capable of yeah. it's like it's like when Gautam Buddha was asked what he'd gained from meditation, he said, I didn't gain a thing. I, I lost so much. And I think that's the same as handstand and these arm balances. People say to me, well, so here, what am I going to gain from that? And I said, that's not the point. It's what do you think you're going to leave behind when you get up there? And the day that you are up there and you're, you'll be amazed at yourself. You'll be amazed at what you're capable of. Is that feeling transferable to other areas of your life? Yeah. that's the social experiment i guess yeah yeah is, definitely if you can feel that good about yourself by doing handstand by convincing yourself that you know what i can do more than i thought i was just restricted by the limitations that i create in my mind yeah can you take that good feeling and think right i'm going to go for that promotional work or i'm going to ask that girl out who works at the coffee shop, you know, because you now feel better about yourself. So yeah. again, although they are modern additions, they're so, so important. And I realized this, Harry, and I worked all this out myself when I was practicing, when I was, when I was thinking to myself, what am I gaining from this? I understand the physiological side of things. I understand what I'm working in terms of muscles. What more is there to gain from this? Yeah. And then when I started teaching it and I started seeing the expressions on people who who I would say, today we're going to do a handstand and I'd see the pure look of horror on their face. And then a week later or two weeks when they could do the headstand, I could see a completely different expression on their face. And I think, wow, how much baggage have you just yeah. let go on? Yeah, 100%. So, I, think, I think Emma's a fantastic example of that, right? One of your teachers and one of our friends, she... I remember she, when she said to me in some of the classes, oh, I can't, can't go upside down, can't do this inverted stuff. I'm absolutely terrified. And I was like, but you're one of the best, best yoga like specimens I've ever seen when it comes to hitting poses and you know, being sort of accurate with your form. And now look at her, upside down all the time, can't stop hand balancing, can't stop we've it, all, and just got past that fear, right? Yeah, we've all got these demons and I, I, we just need to get our head out of our backsides. <laughs> yeah. And... We need to just think to ourselves, right, I'm creating this for myself. And in all honesty, Harry, when teachers turn around and say these inversions and arm balances are not part of yoga tradition, and most of the time it's because they still have their heads up their own backsides and they can't yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, and usually, so yeah. They've enslaved themselves and they want to do the same to their students. They don't want their students to elevate above and beyond what they can do so they tell you it's not real yoga yeah that's yeah, just my awesome. opinion of course yeah of course yeah the um the progressions then that you use with some of your students to get them 
on that pathway to inverting and getting comfortable. Do, do you start them with, with headstand? Is that kind of the first or crow or something like that? Where do you begin? Yeah, I, I do. Um, and there's no real beginner's version. I just demonstrate the pose, Harry, as you might remember. And I'll say, right now, get on with it. And you look <laughs> around and some people just look around and think, what on earth? Is yeah. there an easier option? And I'm like, no, because you probably can do this unless you have a, a, a physical injury, of course. Um, but if you're relatively healthy, you can do this. So there's no physical limitation. So right. you can't ask me to give you a easier version, an easier psychological version, because physically you're capable. So I would just demonstrate the headstand, demonstrate crow pose, arm balance, the most basic and say, right, off you go. Um, and and of course I spend a bit more time with people when I see their expressions but there are so many people Harry who you just love their kind of gusto they just get up there with sometimes an awful technique I'm like no slow down but you got to admire the fact that they are just going beyond um, their fears and just thinking right I'm going to overcome this yeah giving it a good send as we say yeah getting stuck in yeah, fantastic. Now, Zahir, t- tell me a bit more about uh, your book, Yoga, Madness or Meditation. I'm fascinated to, um, I guess, ask you first, where did the idea to write the book come from? I mean, it's not, not an easy task to set out and, and write a book about yoga, let alone about any other topic. Yeah, it was really interesting. On my first date with Laura, we were talking uh, uh, about yoga because she was a yoga teacher. And I was adamant we wouldn't talk about yoga, Harry, as you can imagine. But <laughs> inevitably, it ends up talking about that. And I said a few things about how I feel about the, the madness of the yoga world. And she just kind of laughed and said, you should write a book. Right. I, did, I just thought, no, nah, nothing to it. And then, you know, we kind of fast forward two years later, we're, um, we're married and we're, you know, I was just sat at home and I was just thinking about so many of the things that frustrate and annoy me about the yoga world, the yeah. complete lack of common sense and... Um, <laughs> yeah. And I just thought, right, I, I'm, you know what, if I've got something to say, I should just share it. And it might influence one person. It might help one person through their life. And that's, um, that's enough. So I just said to Laura, I'm going to write a book. And to be honest with you, within a month, it had been, I just went any 10 minutes I had between classes. Um, I would, uh, you know, I wasn't watching any TV or box sets or anything at that time. I wasn't reading. I just completely went off on one and um i then sent it to the obviously the proofreader so she could um come back to me and tell me how absolutely awful my grammar was <laughs> and, uh, i i appreciate your offer i remember you saying if you needed uh if you would uh, you were offering your proofreading services but yeah. <laughs> by then i'd already so what happened is halfway through uh, it was halfway through proofreading that you kindly offered and at that time the proofreader was, she was slowly starting to understand where I was coming from in the direction yeah. of the book. Yeah. So I kind of didn't want to take it away from her because at first everything was like, no, you can't have this in here. You oh, can't really? have here. This is borderline racist. No, actually it is racist. <laughs> this, is, this is offensive. This is uh, sexist. Uh, this is this. And I was like, you know what? Actually, I don't think it is. I appreciate where she's coming from, but I was like, it's very relevant and important to what I'm trying to say. So um, I think she finally got to kind of grips of how my style of writing, because it's, it's, it's done in the, um, in the form of a discussion. Okay. Just like, you know, just like the Gita and yeah. all the kind of great yogic texts. It's very tongue in cheek, by yeah. the way. It's, it's I am my, so it's between me and my consciousness. I'm obviously the confused disciple and my consciousness is this enlightened master who realizes by the end of the conversation, he doesn't know anything himself anyway. We're just going around in circles um, the whole time. <laughs> so it happened in a, a really, um, it, yeah, it just happened. But if you said to me today, Harry, if you said to hear write a book about yoga, I wouldn't know where to start because there's nothing going on. And I think it was just the right time. And I just thought, right, I'm going to go for it. And everything just it just came out fantastic yeah frustration is very often one of the best fuels for writing i find it's a, an amazing yeah. fuel to get what you want to say out on paper so you said about 10 minutes then here and there between classes and that was your kind of system right just try and get it down 
as much as possible whenever you, you know, could? I didn't really want to leave a lot of time um, uh, because of I wanted to be really consistent. Yeah. Uh, and one of my uh, friends, Josh, at the time as well, he was he was working at the studio. Do you remember Josh? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And he was working primarily so he could do all the admin stuff and all the desk stuff. So in between classes, I could just sit in my office, lock the door, and just sometimes spend four or five hours at a time where I didn't have to go down, clean the studio, sign people in. I so see. that was yeah. really helpful, mate. So it, it meant that I, I felt like I was writing my book full time for about three weeks and I was um, working part time during. Yeah. But it was yeah. easy then. I didn't have my baby then. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smart yeah. time to do it. Exactly, mate. Exactly. Yeah. Logistics, they can be a big part in that. Uh, smart. Yeah. Outsource the, the little job so you can crack on and not interrupt that kind of flow state. Right. When you're getting stuff down, you don't want to then pause and go and have to mop up <laughs> somebody yes. else's sweat and then get completely out of it. Right. And you want to continue that that flow and, and get it and get it down um, exactly. where can people get hold of the books are here you can buy it on amazon um it's available um in the states as well canada and that is available in the uk you just uh, search acrim yoga um okay. and you know what it, it's not the, the the most common comment i've had that it's not your typical yoga book um, it's not gonna it it it, it, it more than anything else, it will kind of demystify everything and everything you thought you knew about yoga, it tells you it's probably wrong. Because as we <laughs> know, um, conventional wisdom is always wrong. Yeah. And uh, it, just, it just encourages you more than anything to almost never lose your self-respect. And if you're going to pick up a book today about any subject, me picking up a book today about jujitsu, one book, and I'm going to assume this is the gospel. You can't assume that. Absolutely. And, and this, is, this is the answer to everything. And it's like, I just want you to, I, I just want to encourage you to be more inquiring and, and just question everything. And it's not, you don't question things. Don't think you're being rude by questioning right. things. You're just being true to your nature. Because that's the thing about yoga and jiu-jitsu is that because we're taking on a, uh, a foreign culture and discipline, we feel that if we don't agree with something, we can't yeah. say it out loud because yeah. it's disrespectful. Yeah, there's a it's lot of that. It's not being disrespectful. It's being true to who you are and saying, you know what, that might be part of someone's yoga culture. I personally think it's complete nonsense, but I'm allowed to feel that way. I'm allowed to be true to my nature. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Would you would you advise then people that are maybe starting their yoga journey and and starting to sift through the bullshit? Is that is that one of the the tools you'd say use? Is a critical yeah. mind, ask questions and and, and question your way through. Massively. I mean, I I wrote this in the book as well. I remember reading about Socrates and how the oracle was asked, "Who's the?" Um, who's the wisest man in Rome and she said Socrates and Socrates was like but I don't know anything I just question everything um and it's the same as me you know when and people think I'm being arrogant sometimes so if, if I went to a speech or a talk today and I said if I put my hand up and say well I'm not really sure about that people say was well, he you're so arrogant you think you know better I'm right. like no not at all I just didn't agree and I wanted to learn a bit more or I was challenging that person, not because I know better, because I have a right to ask questions if something, if I don't understand something or I don't agree with something. But we end up blindly agreeing with stuff because that's almost what we're programmed to do. Maybe it's something... It's cultural to, slightly as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah, like it's almost... Like, trained as kids or whatever it is, but, you know... We, so the book does that. The book also explains a bit of psychology about how we're almost wired not to question things as we're growing up and to be a certain way. So when we become adults and we want to learn something new, we just take it as it is. Right. Where we have to learn to think, right, put on the brakes and let's let's question this a little bit more. Let's let's understand this, you know, a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, questions are not to be confused with heckling. <laughs> yeah is, exactly there man. is a difference exactly. yeah there is a difference and i like the fact that you encourage encourage that i always felt open in your classes to be able to ask a question or be able to offer a viewpoint or something like that and that not feel like it's going to get shut down but the opposite that it's encouraged you know and 
and that you like you get a lot of your guys and girls to explore like you said with the headstands you're like go on then crack on see what you discover you know it's not like this is the form and if you don't do it you're all going to burn it's give it yeah. a go see what you but find someone will say to me here what's the best like i put up a handstand tutorial um yesterday on our youtube page and i didn't mention it at the time um but afterwards i thought actually i needed to word this a bit better because this is not me telling you this is how you do a handstand this is me telling you this is how i learned handstand i'm not talking about the version that you taught me harry but how i learned in the basic version so i taught myself and i'm sharing that with you on youtube but the thing is a lot of people will look at that and think oh that's how you're supposed is here saying that's how you should do handstand i'm like no this is how you can try there are yeah. so many different ways you have yeah. to just explore and experiment it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess on that note, what was the, some of the, the takeaways that you found then on getting the handstand for yourself? Was there some drills that you did or was it just relentless repetition? Did you lock yourself in a room for a week until you got it? I, I'll be honest, Harry, I didn't um, because I was never desperate to master it. Yeah. I just kind of did it. And... Um, because I believed that I could do it. I believed I had the, you know, the endurance and the, the, the kind of the character. And I thought, and if I did it every single day for an hour a day, I'd get it in no time. And um, I, I have confidence in my kind of athletic prowess, but I'm not that obsessed by it, Harry. I just do it because I enjoy it. And yeah. it's like all the yoga poses, Harry. There's not a single yoga pose that I obsess over. I do yoga because I love how I feel, I can't do some of the poses and it does not bother me, Harry, because it, it, I don't do yoga to have the best yoga poses so I can put on my Instagram page. <laughs> I do yoga because I love to do it and I love to feel better. So um, interestingly, yoga is not like jujitsu. So in jujitsu, you need to train. If you want to compete, you have to train because you need to be the best. Mm -hmm. You need to beat other people. In yoga, though, the battle is just with yourself. So Absolutely, because yeah. you're not trying to be better than anyone else, you don't need to do it every day. Just do it regularly as part of something you do. That could be one a week, one a month, whatever it is. Do it, but don't obsess about mastering it. And you'll find that, I, personally, in, in my experience, you'll actually end up achieving it quicker because you're not putting that unnecessary pressure on yourself. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it's sometimes counterintuitive, isn't it? Especially to the male psyche. It's yes, like we yeah. want to go in there and get the get the results, get the numbers, get the positions dialed, and actually, you know, just back off a little bit, enjoy it for what it is. I like the, the fact that you said regularity, though. That's and that can be that depends on what your scale of relevance is, right? If it's some yeah, once sure. a week, it might be every every, every yeah. couple of weeks. And I'll tell, I'll tell everyone, it's a science. It, it, you know, if you repeat the action regularly, you will create muscle memory. And your what is unconscious will now become uh, conscious. It will just it it will happen. So what is conscious will become unconscious. So you won't even have to think about it after a while. You'll develop that muscle memory and that neural pathway, and it will just happen. But when they say, "But how regular is regular?" <laughs> I say, "Well, just do it regularly for the rest of your life." Which could be <laughs> there you go. Kind of peak. Well, just just something as part of your lifestyle. It doesn't mean every day, five minutes every morning um you can of course but what i guess what we're trying to imply you don't have to because there's no there's there's no um it's not a competition right. you're just doing the best you can with the body you have and um people who you know wake up every morning do their do their yoga religiously and try to do this oh i have to do my handstand every day i have to do this every day i say to them but who are you doing it for and once, yeah. they, once they kind of are honest with themselves, they realize they're just doing it because they've, they're falling into this very competitive, like modern day Instagram um, kind of competition thing. And it's not actually that healthy for their um, mind. And again, yoga is psychological. So we're in these constant battles, mate. We're in these constant battles of ourselves with how far we should go in the pose, um, what the perfect pose is, how we look how still we are, how perfect the spine is. Um, it's, it's more psychological than it is physiological, Aaron. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I guess my next questions are here for you is, uh, do you meditate? And then if so, what forms of meditation have you found to be the most beneficial either for, for yourself or with, with, with teaching others? I don't meditate is the honest um, answer. I don't meditate in the, in the kind of modern interpretation of what meditation right. is. Right, and that's the thing. It's an umbrella term like yoga, right? It's not very specific, the, the word meditation anymore. Yeah. So, Harry, what brings you uh, the most kind of serenity in your life? What is it that um, if you didn't do, you feel like would affect you physiologically and psychologically? It uh, probably jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu, as of the quarantine, that's what I've noticed the most. So, you know, in many respects, that is your meditation. You know, so my yoga poses and going to the gym, sometimes at work when I, I break off during the day and I go to the gym for half an hour, that's my meditation space. That's yeah. where I'm focusing on breathing and I'm getting away from things. This whole idea, um, Harry, that you should sit, and me and Laura discussed this in a, another YouTube tutorial we did a few days ago. Um, we talk about what meditation is. This whole idea about meditation has become so superficial, Harry. You have to yeah. sit there looking like your favorite yoga teacher with the perfectly straight back, with some type of hand mudra or gesture. <laughs> yeah. And if you do that, you're doing meditation, but you're not. You're just living up to like a, a mo modern or social um, standard of what meditation is. Right. But So it's a very superficial act. Um, but real meditation kind of brings about a sense of calmness. It slows your breathing down. It makes you feel better physiologically, psychologically, more psychologically. So whatever it is that achieves that, people go for walks, long walks with their yeah. earphones on. People go running and, and those, I mean, I'm not a runner, but I hear some of the things people talk about and describe to me when they're going through their running. And that is a form of, of meditation as, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't, the answer is, Harry, I don't meditate in the modern uh, yeah. understanding or if you if you looked at me and thought he's not meditating because he's not sitting there looking really serious chin tucked in uh, adopting some sort of nonsensical hand mudra because my energies connect um waiting for the next gong to be hit but i actually i think i do um meditate because it, it means something to me yeah yeah that's interesting <coughs> excuse me yeah, it's, it's amazing how people are having to live up to the expectation of what meditation should and shouldn't be now. I like the fact that you mentioned there, let, let the sort of the compass towards meditation be how you feel and what, what can you not live without, otherwise you, you, know, you feel worse, especially when it comes to physical activity. With this strange period we're in right now with the, the quarantine and the lockdown, we're recording this at the end of March where the whole world is on pause and people are stuck at home. I think if you're a physical kind of person, you're starting to notice what you're not doing, right? If you're stuck at home and you're not moving as much or you're not playing your sport, maybe now's a really good time for people to pay attention to what their own meditation is, right? Because they might not be getting yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, much. absolutely, mate. I mean, how, what would people do now to go for a long walk with their dog? Or, I mean, we have a park around the back of us, Harry, and we're allowed, allowed really to go out for one form of exercise a day. Yeah. So the weather hasn't been great the past few days, but before then it's been really nice, really sunny. And, you know, I put on the baby carrier, I put my little Zaki in the front and me and Laura go for a walk. And it's what the day is built around, that meditation. It's yeah, that fantastic. being in nature, I mean, breathing in some real good oxygen, you know, and yeah. it, mate, it feels amazing. And I just think we work out what meditation is to us on reflection. If we right. try... Yeah. If we force a meditation or we create meditation, it's n it's not meditation. It becomes a superficial act. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I think reflection, discussion, you might be like, wow, is it here? I've actually been meditating for years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, agree. I remember um, Krishnamurti mentioning something about that. Like meditation, isn't, it's not something you do. Like get past this idea that it's like a, a doing. Yeah. It's, it's the and wrong it's kind but it's a very kind of, it's a very yoga thing. You know, right. um, I mentioned this in my book um, as well about, you know, the, 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 the steps in yoga and these steps in yoga, uh, Patanjali steps, 
they were never written for us, for you and I, Harry. They were perhaps written for a different type of body, a different type of mind thousands of years ago. And the thing is, is the modern day yoga teacher looks at that and thinks, oh, wow, is this the expectation that I'm supposed to climb this ladder, this peak, and I should be at the top. I should be in samadhi. I should be, I should become a Buddha. I should experience nirvana. And if I tell my students, Harry, that I'm still um, kind of worming around the very bottom of this ladder, this yogic ladder, how will they perceive me? How will my fellow yogis perceive me if I tell them that I'm this worm right at the very bottom of this ladder? So you know what I'm going to do, Harry? I'm going to tell everyone I'm on rung four or five or six. Right. And I'm going to start meditating. But according to this kind of ladder of success, it's not that, but that's what it's become in modern yoga. Um, if I'm breathing, if I'm sitting there doing breathing exercises and meditation, I've gone beyond physical poses. I've gone beyond the body. And I'm now this serene yoga person. And that serene yoga person is going to sell books, sell yoga classes and sell retreats. But if I tell you, Harry, that I'm a worm right at the very bottom of this ladder, trying to work out his place in the madness of this yoga world, all I do is the physical poses. Um, how many retreats is that going to sell? How many classes is that going to sell? Yeah, so it's it all a business decision. Yeah. Oh, mate, it does. And people um, have lost their identities. But more importantly than that, and what bothers me the most is they have confused so many people around the world about what yoga is that right. no one knows any longer. So right. this, this is the thing, Harry. I have no problem if you, Harry, wanted to change your name to Krishna Murdu. If you wanted to do that, <laughs> as, if it makes you happy, mate, you do what you want. And, or, or you know, if you want to change your outfits, you want to, whatever you want to do that makes you feel more yogic. If you're doing it, that's fine. Whatever makes you happy. My problem is, is when, your actions then start convincing um, those who are naive and coming into the yoga world, they start to think that's what yoga is or that's what you should do. So your actions have consequences as a yoga teacher. That's my problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're influencing other people that might not know otherwise, right? Yeah, and uh, these are honest, naive people who come to yoga because they just, they need yoga psychologically. You have no idea the trauma some people have been going through or are going through. And they, you know, when we're that desperate, we end up following people blindly for a period yeah. of time. That's what we need. We need like a father figure, someone to show us the way. And it has horrible long-term consequences. The, Harry, I'm not just um, bragging when I say this, but the amount of lives that I've touched and changed since I opened the studio is the reason I do this for a living. Right. And some of the stories when I tell um, you know, I, I get a little bit like, wow, like it, it gives me a funny feeling inside, almost, almost chokes me a little bit. I've had people who have been on the edge and have said that, you know what, I, I don't want to live and I'm doing things that are really bad for me because I don't want to live any longer. They've come to me, um, we've done yoga and I haven't done anything, Harry, but be myself. Okay. And the, the, how much I've changed some people's lives, it, or not I have, sorry, the studio has, the environment has. Yep. And it's because we don't try to be anything we are not. I don't tell them that if you do this chant every day, this chant that I can't pronounce myself, by the way, properly, but if you do that, <laughs> and then if you bang on a gong every night before you go to bed, and if you do this, and if you do a yoga practice, and don't forget to pay me to teach you a course on how you can cleanse your imaginary chakras, all you're doing is taking advantage of vulnerable people. But if you be yourself as authentically as you can, they will be inspired by your strength of character. And that doesn't cost anything. And you will change lives by just being who you are. It's actually easier, Harry, to influence someone positively than it is negatively. You actually have to work your ass off to act like an idiot to influence someone negatively. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of effort. So it's actually easier. Just be yourself. If your name is Wendy, be Wendy. If your name is Harry and you used to be an alcoholic, not that you are, but I'm just saying, if you did grow, who cares? Whatever your situations is, whatever your baggage is, 
have it and express it because everyone has some battle they're fighting anyway. Yeah. Be yourself. And again, your strength of character and your personality will inspire people a hell of a lot more than this fake phony character that you're going to display for people. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you teach a lot of new yoga teachers. There's a big educational component to your studio in, in the UK. Is that some uh, words of encouragement you give to new teachers coming through is to ultimately be yourself as a teacher and, and drop the kind of... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Harry. We don't teach a dialogue. We um, don't give you a sequence. We don't tell you what to say. We don't tell you what to wear. I, 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 I teach people um, what I believe is the art of teaching and what I believe is the art of communication. So how do you teach triangle? You explain to someone using clear terms clear words what you want them to do okay bend your left knee straighten your right leg keep your spine straight raise your arms up and people say is that all i'm like yes what else do you need to say you don't need to say tuck this in draw that in lift the heart lengthen through the crown of the head all these yogic terms you don't need because that's not you're, you're playing the actor role again you just right. want to learn how to communicate with people so as far as teaching yoga goes, that's what we do is we, I mean, I mean, one of the students said to me, see here, how do you teach someone to reach up towards the ceiling, stretch, and then reach all the way back down again to the floor? I said, just say that. Say that, yeah. She goes, oh my God, am I really allowed? And I'm like, wow, of, of course you are. <laughs> but right. that's how complicated it's become now. People are yeah. looking for this dialogue when it doesn't exist it's using clear simple terminology that because you, know, you might have a, a japanese person in your class who doesn't have great english you might have someone with a hearing aid you might have um so many different types of people in your class and yogic words and borrowed yoga terminologies that your favorite teacher says or that you've read you read online they're not going to help you communicate with these people, but actually being yourself and using clear, basic terms, yeah. everyone in your class is going to understand, and that's what's going to make you a good teacher. Yeah. And as far as philosophy is concerned, I tell everyone, by the end of this course, you will be 100% confident in knowing that you don't know a thing yeah. about anything. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the objective truth number one. <laughs> you don't yeah. know anything. Yeah. Exactly, mate. We have a bunch of theories we can discuss and talk about, but that's all they are. It's man's theories and interpretations. And over time, you'll develop your own. Yeah, no, 100%. That's refreshing. And do you find that when uh, there's a pattern to what people are coming to your, uh, to learn to become a yoga teacher, are there common reasons why they're becoming a yoga teacher is there is there a reason that stands out more than the others and i don't know that's a tough question harry i'll be honest i don't have an answer for that i haven't worked out a pattern yet but interestingly in terms of the, i thought you were going to ask that people who come to the studio that has changed a lot okay when i first got into teaching it was all physical harry it was people coming in for tight hamstrings mm. now people just come in for more psychological reasons really like, headspace you know um de-stress is you know i would say 70 percent of people come now and they don't come for physical reasons so it's, yeah. a wow. it's been a massive massive shift um really interesting to observe my my um approach to teaching doesn't change however i still teach uh physical poses because mm. ultimately people might come to you for psychological reasons but you're still qualified to teach a physiological practice you're still qualified to teach a physical form of exercise so just because people come to you with psychological issues doesn't mean you suddenly change your job description and you start trying to act like you are some sort of psychologist or a meditator you know it's like me coming to you harry that say i've had a mental breakdown it should not change how you teach me you still kind of honor the practice and teach me jujitsu you don't suddenly change and think oh wow should i deal with this guy's emotional issues that's not your it's not your that, job no it's not at all mate at all yeah. so it it's really interesting why people are coming but it's more important that yoga teachers in the modern world understand that it's not their jobs to actually uh deal with that because if they needed someone to deal with that they would go to that person direct they would go to psychologists they come yeah. to you because they need movement they need exercise yeah absolutely yeah, and that sticking to that is the best thing you can offer as a as a teacher, right? And not 
yeah not not changing always, your course. Uh, always remember and i tell the teachers this i tell existing teachers this and new teachers what is your scope of practice what are you qualified to teach and what are you qualified um what is what are your qualifications what makes you a yoga teacher always remember that always remind yourself that you're not a dietitian you're not a health and fitness professional unless you are you're a yoga teacher you're not there to give um health and fitness advice you're not a physiotherapist um none of these things you're a yoga teacher designed to teach physical yoga poses to the general population and even with all the studying and research and educating that i've done over the years i still consider myself a physical yoga teacher that's it nothing more because that's that's my job yeah yeah i find it fascinating you said there about people coming into the studio and you've seen it more mental for mental reasons why do you think that is do you think that's with screens and technology and the stress of modern pace of life um i may i really don't know i interesting i'm um i i was you know i've been amazed by that um you know whether there's more uh press now about how yoga is good for stress whereas in right before you and i if we were stressed we wouldn't we we associate yoga with um you know fancy lycra women um breathing and stuff you know it that was the old impression of yoga now um as um men trying to do something in de-stress I can't really think of many things we would do. Yoga just seems to spring up now. So somehow yoga has been marketed quite well at the same time as men's uh, kind of ideas of what yoga is has changed as well. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, it's, uh, there's been a shift that you've noticed. Yeah, that's really cool. So people can get the book from Amazon, Yoga, yes. Madness or Meditation. Meditation or Madness? Madness or Meditation. Madness or Meditation. Good, so they can have a search for that. And then for those that are in the UK listening to this, where is your studio located? We're based in Adelstone in Surrey. Uh, we used to be in Woking and um, our lease came up. So we moved over to a much um, better premises. It's um, more it's more us. Um, yeah, it's a very cool you know, space. Don't be uh, fooled by the outside. It's an old bank on the inside. We've uh, tried to make it look as... Um, I wouldn't say as yogic as possible. I guess I just wanted to create an environment where you know you're somewhere to de-stress or to get away from whatever it is you, you've got away from. Right. I, I didn't want it to be bright lit like in the gym. Because also what tends to happen, Harry, is uh, they did this really interesting study a few years ago, or longer than that actually, where a personal trainers stretch clients inside the gym and uh, their kind of mobility was measured. And then the clients were stretched by the same person trainer in an environment that they didn't associate with bright lights, gung-ho, loud music, yeah. and they were going like 15, 20% further. Wow. So how much difference the environment affects your body's response to things. It's almost like when you're in the gym, that your heart rate goes up, your muscles tighten, ready to accelerate, ready to run, yeah. ready to do something gung-ho. Um, but in the yoga studio, you go in and I think your brain processes everything differently and just gets you to relax a little bit more. Yeah, um, so it is, it's, you know, you can go on the website at cramyoga.co.uk and you can have a little look. We've obviously got pictures of, of the studio in there too. Yeah, get everyone, go online, check it out. It's a very cool space and it's an experience as well, which I really like. The first time I went there, I was looking around on the posters on the walls and working my way through up to the, the change rooms. It was a, a cool experience. Is it? as much as the actual quality of the, the classes and the teaching. And then can people find you on um, Instagram and you said YouTube as well? Yeah, uh, Instagram, uh, uh, Akram underscore yoga. Um, and then my wife is uh, underscore Laura yoga. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a YouTube page, Akram yoga. We um, have a few classes on there as well that we did recently for people under lockdown and, you know, we do online classes uh, that people pay for, but there's also, Harry, a huge bunch of people who are so concerned about their kind of um, economical futures now. They don't want to pay for classes because they're just not sure what's, what's happening down the line. So we, we've done a few free classes on there. Um, generally, I wanted to make our YouTube page more educational, you know, things like this. And uh, me and Laura discuss what meditation is. There's 
um, an interview with the chiropractor, my friend Mika on there about some of the things, movement. There's a video on there about uh, what I spoke about earlier, about what is a loaded flexion, uh, an unloaded flexion. And if anyone suffers with back pain, it, it, you know, it's a must to hear and understand the difference between when you forward fold, when your hands are not supporting something and when they're not supporting, it is, it, the difference is like day and night if you have a bad back. So it's really yeah. important. Fantastic. Well, Zaheer, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's, it's been, been an absolute, absolute pleasure. It's so pleasure, great yeah. to see you again. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. We'll be getting you on again soon. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to discussing more things about madness or meditation. Thank you, my man. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Move Mind podcast with my guest today, Zaheer. Akram, fantastic chat about all things yogic and the meditation and the madness to go with it. You can follow us on Instagram at MoveMind and read some of our articles online on our website, movemind.online. And if you have any questions that you want to send in to us directly, you can reach us via email, movemindonline at gmail.com. Thanks for checking out the show and we'll catch you next time. This episode of the Move Mind podcast is brought to you by CBD Mountain, the sport and fitness CBD. Head over to cbdmountain.com for a range of soft gels, skin balms, oils and vapes, and purchase online and have the premium quality CBD delivered directly to your door. cbdmountain.com